got uh, Sam Bauman today. Uh, Sam is an assistant professor in uh, NYU in data science and uh, linguistics. He's uh, responsible for better or worse, I guess, uh, for some of the largest and most commonly used uh, data sets and benchmarks uh, that have been that have kind of like been, dri been driving a lot of NLP in the last few years. I don't know how you feel about your carbon footprint, but we can talk about this later. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's what he's going to talk about today, but I want to take advantage of the introduction to mention a friend of research that maybe is going to be less adverse today. Uh, so Sam did this really cool work in the last few years, I think a lot of it with Adina Williams, about a kind of a studying the emergence of a linguistic structures in, the, in a lot of the models that we have been uh, training uh, in the last few years, and kind of understanding what kind of notions of syntax they're getting. So I think we're not going to hear about this today, so I really recommend reading it some really interesting work there. So thank you for joining us, and I'd like to welcome Sam. Yeah, so this is my this is my room full of engineers talk. I'm giving my room full of linguists talk in a, in a few weeks to a different group. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so I'll be talking about a line of work that I think has gone from sort of a substantial but fairly small thread of research in the NLP community to completely sort of blowing up the field to some degree in the last couple of years. Um, I'm going to talk about sort of my take on this area and some work that my group has done on this area, but this is going to be partially just a survey. So uh, a lot of this was driven by uh, work by people much more talented than, than me or I'm not going to disparage my group. Anyway, so we'll be talking about uh, this idea of task independent language understanding. So I'll, I'll try a couple different ways to explain what I mean by that. So to put it one way, the goal of this line of work is to develop a general purpose neural network encoder for text, which makes it possible to solve any new language understanding task using only enough training data to define the possible outputs. So all your training data needs to do is sort of tell you, like, how is this task different from some other task? Another way to think of this is we want to develop a neural network model that already understands English or already understands the language we're working with before we start training it to do any particular task we care about. And this is my, my silly analogy, the, uh, the power drill, where you can sort of take the, the expensive part, the fancy motor and the fancy battery, and, and swap out all kinds of different tools on the other end. So if you don't, your, your, model, your, your model already knows how to make something spin very fast uh, before you start setting it up for your task. So we'll start with a, a case study of um, just a brief overview of a model that I think um, kind of brought this line of work into the the foreground of a lot of more applied research in NLP, which is this, this model called ELMO that uh, came out late 2017, published 2018. So to train an ELMO model, um, you train two RNN language models. So you're training a left to right, two layer, big LSTM model to read uh, sentences of running text, just random text from the internet from the left to right. And as it's reading, it's trying to predict what the next word will be. In parallel, on the same data, you're training this blue model that doesn't share any information with the orange model that's reading from uh, right to left and um, that's trying to predict sort of the previous word at each step. So you train these two models, uh, sort of 100 million parameters or so, big models on um, as much text as you can get your hands on. Then you lop off the top layer. You lop off the, the layer of the network that had been um, actually predicting what the next word was. Uh, that sort of output, that softmax. You freeze the parameters, you stop, um, you sort of tell your optimizer to stop updating these parameters, and then you drop a smaller task-specific neural network model on top and train that for your task. And so the idea is you're replacing what had been a very simple input function in your task-specific neural network, here you might have been using regular word embeddings before, with this big pre-trained fixed neural network that you've trained on a great deal of data. Works quite well. Um, the sort of evaluation they did was to take um, uh, sort of the best available open source models for six different prominent tasks and uh, simply replace the input layer with ELMO. And across the board, they got at least noticeable uh, improvements over these strong baselines. And one of us paper and the, um, the, this got quite a lot of attention. I think people started to realize in the field that task specific training was a problem. Uh, the summer of last year, there was a lot of interest in sort of understanding why ELMO worked and how far we could push this ELMO idea, among other things. Um, every attendee to one of the major NLP conferences was given an ELMO stuffy. Anyway, uh, this sort of launched the hype around this kind of work. 
And it was, it was a good idea. It worked. And it was the first, the first piece of this line of work that I think was really showing substantial impact on a range of applied tasks. So that's kind of just a, a vignette of what kind of thing I'll be talking about. What's the rest to talk about? I'm going to talk about the glue benchmark. This is a competition we've been running in this area and sort of what, what this is and what, we've, what we think we've learned from this. Talk about some of the models that have, that have popped up um, sort of in conjunction with the glue, men, the glue benchmark. Talk a little bit about some analysis work we've done trying to understand sort of why models like uh, ELMO and uh, BERT uh, work so well. Um, talk about the super glue benchmark. This is a sort of newer, newer effort that's, that's more recent than some of the rest of the talk. Um, and then a very brief little vignette at the end on a, on a sort of boring practical method that I think is worth knowing if you're working on, if you're working using these kinds of tools. Anyway, what's glue? <clears throat> so glue is um, an open-ended shared task competition and evaluation platform for general purpose sentence encoders, for sort of sentence level models in the style of Elmo. This is joint work with a couple people at NYU and um, University of Washington and, and uh, DeepMind. So to put together Glue, we collected a set of nine existing um, English language understanding tasks um, that we tried to make as sort of diverse as possible in sort of the, the fundamental degree of difficulty of this task, how, how subtle or complicated the task is meant to be, how much training data is available, and how closely the training data resembles the test data, how much of a sort of domain shift you have to deal with, um, and the style or genre of language that you're addressing within sort of US international English. And um, we again sort of, we, we did not create new data for this. We were just trying to, to collect a set of tasks that we thought would be sort of representative of what we thought were kind of the hard open problems in applied language understanding at the time. Um, the tasks all have very simple APIs, and we wanted to make it very easy to sort of adapt a system to all nine of the tasks. They're all sentence classification or sentence pair classification. Um, and the leaderboard is set up pretty straightforwardly in the, the sort of Kaggle or Semival style, where you just download unlabeled test data, run your model to label it, and upload it. And because of this, there's no real constraint on what the model is. If you've got some system that's sort of somehow a coherent or unified whole that can um, deal with a bunch of different language understanding tasks, you can send it off into the competition. Here is the set of tasks we chose. I'm not going to go through them in too much detail, but just looking at the sizes of the training sets, um, we think we've got a, a reasonably nice range from about 500 at the low end to about a um, little under half a million at the high end. Looking at genre, we've got movie reviews, uh, social media, QA questions from Quora, Wikipedia, and a couple of these sort of miscellaneous uh, multi-genre uh, data sets also contain transcribed uh, spoken language. So you get some spoken genres, spoken genres as well. Zooming in on, on a couple of these that will come up later, uh, one of them from our group is the Corpus of Linguistic Acceptability. Um, this is a binary classification task with about 10,000 examples um, <coughs> where you're asked to look at a string of English words and decide if they make up a plausible sentence, a sentence that a, a fluent English speaker would say. So you'll have examples like, uh, who do you think that will question Seamus first? And the gardener planted roses in the garden. Uh, the second one is perfectly normal. This first one is a little bit odd. Um, sort of a, if you're, at least if you're a native speaker, you should understand the sentence, but you're going to notice that this word that here doesn't really belong. It's not something you'd say. Um, the motivation for this task sort of to exist in the first place was driven by some open questions in linguistic theory. And we actually drew all of this data from the linguistics literature, from about 25 publications. Um, it's a lot of work in, uh, especially morphology and syntax. Data of this kind is the primary form of data that's being studied. And there are some interesting questions there about what it takes to learn to make this kind of judgments on this kind of data. So these kind of senses, but the, the senses are unrelated. Like, like in this example, it's more like minimal pairs where the senses are trying to be as possible. In, uh, in, this, in this data set, the sentences are isolated. So you're simply just reading a string and making a judgment. This is two, these are two examples. But good question. There's, there's more I could talk about, and a lot more I could talk about if this were the room full of linguists. Um, the other data set I want to point out, this is also sort of the other of these data sets that I had something to do with, uh, conflict of interest here, is the multi-genre natural language inference, or MNLI corpus. This is a, a balanced classification task for pairs of sentences with the labels uh, entailment, contradiction, and neutral. 
Um, here's a, a typical example. This is drawn from the sort of science fiction section of the corpus. Um, you'll read a premise sentence. The old one always comforted Kadan, except today. Kadan knew the old one very well. This would be neutral. If, you, if I tell you that this first sentence is true, you can't conclude that the second one must be true, which would be an entailment, and you also can't conclude that it must be false, which would be a contradiction. So balance classification for this. The training set is drawn from five pretty different sources of, of text, and the test set is drawn from 10 sources. It's a section of the test set that requires you to adapt to a fairly, fairly different domains than you saw during training. So that's glue. Um, we start to give a brief tour of sort of what's, what happened since we launched this competition. So here are our baselines. Um, <clears throat> simplest baseline, sort of simplest general purpose NLP, NLP model you might try is a bag of word embeddings model with pre-trained glove word embeddings. This gets about 50, uh, 60 points. Uh, these points, unfortunately, aren't on any scale. This is the average of the nine task-specific metrics for the nine different tasks. Um, the two more meaningful benchmarks are these two, a, the more, more, more meaningful baselines. One is a, the collection of nine single task models. This is what you'd get if you um, built nine different models using what seemed like sort of state-of-the-art methods circa early 2018 for each of these nine tasks and train them just on the nine separate training sets. Um, so this is sort of for these methods to be useful, you have to be beating these baselines. We have to be showing we're doing something better than you could uh, with these methods. This is the best model from a family of older methods, these sentence, sentence embedding or sentence to vector models. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about these, but this was a, an earlier family of methods that was not up to this point getting us anything that much better than, than these simple baselines. And then Elmo is doing a couple of points better at about um, 68 or 69 points. First uh, major thing we saw sort of appear on the benchmark, Elmo was sort of roughly contemporaneous with the launch of this. Uh, opening IGPT was the first one that was evaluated sort of explicitly on Glue. Um, this model follows the same basic idea as Elmo. It's a big language model trained in a bunch of unlabeled text and then adapted for um, sort of classification applications. But they tweaked a number of things that turned out to be important. They switched to a transformer model architecture. So this is a sort of not a recurrent network. This is this alternative uh, sort of more efficient to train uh, approach for processing sequences. Um, the entire network is fine-tuned for each task. So with Elmo, we, we sort of pre-trained this network and froze it and added new parameters on top of it that we'd have to train. Uh, with, this, with this model, uh, the models that are, that'll sort of come after it, what you do is you, you pre-train your, um, you pre your large network and then you simply switch from training it as a language model to training it as something else. You, you sort of adapt the output layer to produce the kind of output you want, and then just sort of propagate gradients into the language model and try to convert it into the thing that you want. This turns out to work well, especially for uh, fairly data poor tasks. And finally, pre-training is done. The initial training is done on long spans of running text rather than isolated sentences. Even though we're evaluating isolated sentences, it seems like having access to this longer distance context during training. So this gets a nice improvement. It actually gets a bigger improvement over, um, over Elmo than Elmo got over uh, its own baselines. So these, these little tweaks add up to something that worked quite well. And sort of fairly shortly after the appearance of OpenAI's model, um, we saw Google's BERT. This is thing you'll hear a lot about in this talk, and many of you have probably heard way too much about it already. Um, but what is BERT for those who haven't seen it? BERT is, again, a sort of slightly tweaked version of OpenAI's GPT model. It's, again, a transformer model trained on a bunch of unlabeled text. Um, but they don't quite do traditional language models. This isn't a standard sort of left to right generative model of sequences. They, they use a couple of, of slightly weirder objectives for pre-training. Um, these objectives allow the model to process text in both directions together uh, at training time. So Elmo had separate networks reading reading um, <coughs> sentences in both directions. GPD simply read sentences from left to right. Um, this method helps you get sort of richer representations of the words in the middle of a span of text. And it's bigger. Um, there is a, a BERT model that's the same size as GPT and Elmo, but the, the, primary, the one that's primarily used is about three times larger. And this gets a big improvement. Again, just these sort of these are a few tweaks on the same basic idea of Elmo, which, which in turn was sort of the same basic idea as a couple of papers that had come earlier, but this sort of tuning and tweaking adds up to quite a bit, that it's getting a bigger improvement over GPT on these nine tasks than GPT was getting over Elmo. 
And I'll, I'll get back to this. I'll, I'll keep sort of narrating the leaderboard, for better or worse. But um, let me sort of pause to talk a little bit about what we know about BERT, or at least sort of my group's take on what we know about BERT. Fantastic question. Yeah. Can, can we treat these as roughly linear, or is what's actually happening internally like much different? Like the huge jump on one of the baselines or something? Um, oh, so talking about sort of how this how this reflects um, the, the improvements on the individual line tasks. Or? Well, like I, when you see these numbers, you can kind of say, oh, it, it, it gets twice as big of an improvement. But I don't know if that's actually true because you're averaging together a bunch of different size and different challenging sets. And... Yeah, it's um, most of the most of the improvements we see on this are strict improvements across all or all but one of the tasks. So sort of, I think GPD is better than Elmo at maybe eight of the nine. Yeah. Um, the scales of the improvement vary, vary a lot. And this is one thing, and, and the fact that we're using this sort of unitless scale is something we're, we're not completely comfortable with, but I don't think we can find anything that would be obviously more principled, um, that a couple of the tasks just have, just tend to show higher variation across, across runs, across methods. And so those, those tasks are sort of disproportionately contributing to this. But fortunately, so. everything does seem to be well correlated. Gotcha. Um, so give a, a couple of studies that sort of try to give some sense of what BERT is doing. Uh, these are really just pointers into what's turned into a really big literature lately. But uh, one of these that I wanted to mention is this work on um, edge probing. This, this came out of a, a big group project last summer at this JSALT program at, at Johns Hopkins. Um, leader of the project is actually someone at Google, uh, Ian Tenney. But what we, what we did here is we, um, we took a pre-trained BERT or ELMO model and, and froze it on the, the assumption that, that shows up in many analyses of this kind, that sort of by freezing the model you're, um, and training a classifier that way, you're getting more of a picture of what it is the model already knows, what it is the model's already doing, rather than sort of what the model can be trained to do. So we freeze our model, and we drop a sort of lightweight classifier on top of the model for a bunch of different low-level NLP tasks. And there's a lot to say about exactly how we design this, but essentially what we're doing is we're asking um, can we train a very, very lightweight model on top of frozen BERT to do part of speech tagging or sort of parsing, sort of sentence structure evaluation or um, named entity recognition, sort of identifying uh, references to people or, or things um, or co-reference resolution, identifying sort of how the model treats repeated references to the same thing. Um, and the hope is that sort of if we um, if we get good results in this kind of evaluation and are sort of beating strong baselines here, that's evidence that, that these pre-trained models are already essentially solving these low-level NLP tasks under the hood. Um, so here's kind of the, the first wave of results from this, this study looking just at Elmo. What we're comparing here are the, the yellow bars looking at the word embeddings, the sort of fixed word vectors coming out of Elmo. And the idea here is that to the extent to which you can solve these problems using fixed word embeddings, um, you're, you're sort of, you don't need a larger model to be doing anything interesting. So what we're focused on is the improvement that you can get over, um, over these, these baselines on each of these tasks. So for um, part of speech tagging, we do see some improvement. Um, the sort of simple baselines are already doing well, um, but we do see improvement. For parsing, we see substantial improvements. This, for Elmo, seems like the, uh, the area where it's sort of adding the most. Um, for entity, uh, sort of named entities, we're seeing only a very slight improvement. For co-reference resolution, this is tracking sort of uh, repeated references to the same entity, possibly by different names or using pronouns. Um, we have a, a, simpler, a simpler data set onto notes that's kind of reasonably normally distributed examples of this where we do see some improvements but then there's a, another kind of Winograd style data set, DPR, that's meant to target cases where this requires some kind of reasoning or, or higher level understanding of the sentences. And here, I'm not doing anything. Uh, can you explain again, I saw I kind of missed, what's the difference between Elmo's word representations versus Elmo itself? Yeah, sorry, this is an annoying distinction to figure out how to put on a slide. But um, this is the, these are, um, these are word vectors. So here you just have a, a dictionary of, 50,000 or so um, vectors representing words. This is the input that's going into the Elmo neural network um, and doesn't depend on context. So if you're doing part of speech tagging here, 
you're simply looking at a word. You don't know anything about its context and trying to guess its part of speech. And it turns out that's pretty easy. Like most of the time you see the word potato, it's a noun. Um, but this sort of doesn't let you deal with ambiguous cases. And Elmo is the word representations that are coming out of this neural network that do incorporate context information. Thank you. So let's add in uh, the BERT models, where we've got the sort of small, uh, smaller version of BERT and the larger version of BERT. Um, looking at part of speech, it looks like Elmo is really already at the ceiling. BERT isn't adding anything. Looking at these parsing tasks, the better the the smaller BERT model does add a little bit, but more or less these models were already probably doing as well as you can do under this under this framework. With coreference, though, with, especially with this sort of more common sense and reasoning oriented coreference task EPR, you do see real improvements. This is where it seems like um, the sort of BERT model is making the is making the clearest gains. It seems like the kind of lowest level sentence structure type stuff um, we sort of more or less figured out that language models are pretty good at getting this at even a moderately large scale. And as we're making these further improvements, we're moving more into kind of more meaning or reasoning oriented behavior that's being learned. Yeah. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but what's the difference between unto notes uh, core reference versus DPR core reference? Yeah, so these are, the task in both of these is, is this core reference task is sort of um, uh, Mary was hoping that she would be able to go to the city tomorrow. Um, and it's this sort of, all right, Mary and she, are those the same person? Antonotes is um, sort of taking a, an existing tech corpus and just annotating any cases that might be co-referenced in that corpus. Uh, DPR was semi-automatically filtered. I don't know the full details of the corpus construction to isolate cases where there are multiple, multiple entities in the sentence that could reasonably be referred to. That there's no sort of structural or grammatical constraint that prevents um, this pronoun from referring to any of any of multiple different candidates. And so it's, it's picking these cases where you can't use clear surface information. You have to, to understand the situation, understand what's being talked about to resolve the ambiguity. At least that's, the, that's what it's designed for. Yeah? Question. So you're comparing Elmo and Bert as models, but they're pre-trained, right? So are, do they have equivalent um, corpora that they're pre-trained on? Uh, no, this is a, a very good point. Um, these these comparisons are confounding a bunch of different things. So um, Elmo and Bert use different architectures, which uh, different optimization schemes, and somewhat different data sets. So we're, this is a, a rough sense to try to get a sense of just, or sort of a rough attempt to try to get a sense of when we've been making progress in this area, what, what is that reflecting? What, sort of what kinds of things are, are we getting better at learning? But this isn't telling us anything about why. This isn't telling us anything about whether it's the architecture or the data or something else. Um, and there's been a few follow-up studies. This sort of has gone, has built up into a larger project, mostly within Google, trying to uh, sort of apply this method with these tasks to more different internal parts of these models and more models and try to sort of dive more deeply into this. But that's all I wanted to show. From that study, I want to then go on and immediately cast doubt on, on the thing I just presented um, with a follow-up that I'm excited about that's sort of asking how much we can trust these qualitative claims, um, like this claim that, that sort of uh, BERT, this large BERT model is much better than sort of previous models at internally representing co-reference. So these studies that use some kind of auxiliary analysis data set, that use some kind of um, sort of specialized task data set in order to study what a larger model knows, this is becoming a really common method in NLP. There's a, a workshop series black box that's pretty much dedicated to this, and this has become sort of one of the default kinds of papers at NLP conferences recently. Um, there are lots and lots of ways you can design these studies. It's sort of rare that you'll see two papers that even that use quite the same methodology for this kind of probing or classifier-based analysis work. And all of these methods bake in some kind of substantial assumptions that are usually not completely justified. So for example, the style that we were using in edge probing assumes that if some model uh, knows about coreference, then it should be possible to extract that coreference information using a simple compact NLP neural network over frozen weights. That makes some assumptions about what's being represented where in the model and about sort of just the geometry of the hidden states in that model that aren't completely warranted. It's a bit of a hack. Um, and, and we don't really know how that's affecting our results. So what we're trying to do in this, in this study is ask, 
do different kind of reasonable, widely used methods for doing this kind of probing tend to give you the same answer when you ask questions like this? So um, this is an odd paper. It has 14 asterisks for first authors. Uh, this actually came out of a linguistic seminar group with a bunch of people interested in getting into the sort of birdology, studying bird with machine learning uh, work. And we, what we did is we just picked a narrow question we wanted to ask and tried to ask it as many ways as we could reasonably justify it. So I'll quickly run through what the question is, but this is sort of not, not, the, not the main point of the study. Um, we're interested in NPI licensing. This is a, a grammatical phenomenon that basically explains why Mary hasn't eaten any cookies sounds fine, and Mary has eaten any cookies sounds a little weird. That's not something you'd, you'd normally say. So these NPI words, negative polarity items like any or ever, uh, can only occur in um, a handful of particular configurations. If they're in a negated environment or the antecedent of a conditional or a question, they're allowed, otherwise they're not. These phenomena are pretty common in natural data. They're pretty well understood in linguistics. There's a lot of work on just where these words show up and why we think they're there. Um, figuring out when NPIs are allowed to occur requires reasoning about long distance dependencies in pretty complex structures rather than just local co-occurrence, so it seems like it should be hard. But it's primarily sort of syntactic grammatical surface phenomenon, so we should be able to learn this from raw text alone. So does BERT know when NPIs are licensed? Does BERT know when words like any can appear? So we built some evaluation data. This we just kind of did semi-automatically by hand. We put together a bunch of examples of uh, these NPI sentences with or without these violations. So with or both grammatical sentences and ungrammatical sentences, we checked with human annotators to make sure that the, the annotations were correct. That's our, that's our test data. But we're going to use this a bunch of different ways. The first study we ran was training BERT on this COLA training set I introduced earlier, this data set of these general sort of acceptability or grammaticality judgments. And we tested it on our NPI test sets. And we're using um, essentially accuracy, something called Matthews correlation to measure performance. But we're just asking, if we train a model to judge acceptability, can it judge our sort of specialized NPI sentences? The glove bag of words baseline, this is our sort of trivial baseline, um, basically doesn't work. It, it gets near, near random guessing performance. This seems reasonable. It's not able to track any kind of sophisticated structure. It's just looking at the back words. BERT does OK. So provisional conclusion looking at this result, BERT knows a bit about NPIs, but it's not perfect. But what if we train on, um, what if we train on the specialized data? We can put together a nice train test split where um, by doing some sort of hold one out, hold one out swapping around of the training sets, we can make sure that none of the examples in the training set um, for our task resemble the test examples at all, but where still all of our training examples are dealing with NPIs and are in the same style as uh, the test set. So we add, if we use this specialized training data, suddenly the bag of words model does much, much better. And BERT is only doing slightly better. So looking at this, BERT's barely above its baseline. We shouldn't be too optimistic. Provisionally, let's say BERT knows something about NPIs, but not all that much. Not all that much. What if we do minimal pairs? What if we recast the task to say, you have to look at a pair of sentences, and we'll only count you as having gotten it right if you, if you make the correct judgments for both. So to get this right, you have to say that one is, one is acceptable and two is unacceptable. And if you don't make both of those judgments, you get zero credit. So this is sort of a harsher metric. Turns out this harsher metric gets us about the same pattern of results. We see some, something kind of promising if we train on the out-of-domain data. Looking at this in-domain data, it, it really looks less encouraging. So again, we'll make this sort of more pessimistic conclusion. What if we run the experiment, same experiment with a different metric? What if we still use minimal pairs, but we use the, a weaker metric where we say, the model should assign a higher probability to the first sentence than the second. It should think that the first sentence is more likely to be acceptable than the second, regardless of what its overall judgment is on, on either of them. Um, I think this is a, a defensible way to, way to look at this. If the model is making these judgments pretty much perfectly, I think that means it has to be taking into account NPI licensing. And here, BERT is at ceiling. BERT is getting essentially perfect performance, even with the out-of-domain training data. It really does seem like we can infer from this that BERT is tracking this, this phenomenon. But let's try to refactor this another way. Um, what if we just test BERT directly with no training data? BERT is essentially a language model. We can um, there are some, some quirks in this, but for our data, we can ask BERT 
which of two sentences is just more likely to appear in a corpus, looks more like English. And we have these nice sort of controlled sentences that differ in only one word. Um, here, Kurt does okay. It's not, near, it's not at ceiling, though, like it was when we were training it for the task. Sort of asking Bert for these probabilities directly it doesn't look as encouraging. The bag of words model doesn't have this ability, so we don't have as direct of a baseline here. One more option. What if we use a, a probing classifier with a, a probing sort of auxiliary task? Here, instead of asking about acceptability, instead of asking sort of which sentence is correct, we're going to ask um, about something a little bit more specific, about if a given word position, if like the, the italicized word here, like ever in this example or ever in this example, is in a licensing environment, is in a configuration where you could put an NPI, whether or not one is there, we reorganize our data to train a, this sort of specialized classifier for this. We train a little auxiliary classifier glued onto the side of a BERT model. And here, the results we get are somewhat encouraging. BERT is not perfect, but it's much, much better than the baseline at this task. Question. Yeah. Where does baseline lie for all these tasks? <laughs> Um, so the, the baseline, the baseline that I was referring to is is this glove bag of words model. So we do the same evaluation, but <laughs> representing sentences just as a sum of word embeddings. If that's no, the no, question. no, the human human baseline. Oh, human baseline. Um, we didn't do we didn't do a human evaluation for all of these sort of versions of the task, but for um, for the acceptability judgment task, humans that are, are at around ninety percent accuracy. Um, I don't have I don't have the the precise comparison. We actually factored the numbers out differently in the paper that I'm doing in these slides. But <clears throat> yeah, humans make errors, but they find this task generally pretty easy. Is that native speakers? <laughs> um, that was Mechanical Turk users. So I think I think in the U.S. So not necessarily. But anyway, so we we. Um, we kind of we make all these different conclusions. I think all of these studies are meant to, to pretty closely follow a method that has actually been used to make claims in published work about what Bert does or doesn't know. None of these claims is exactly wrong. Um, I think you could you could justify each of these studies, but they're all premised on some assumptions that aren't really stated here, and they, they look pretty different. And so I think all I want all I want to take away from this study is that if you see claims of this form, sort of Bert knows so and so or BERT internally represents so-and-so. It's worth reading the fine print. It's worth figuring out exactly how that, that was asked. And it's worth looking for corroborating evidence, sort of making sure, does this, do you get the same conclusion if you look at things a little bit differently? So I want to jump back into the sort of leaderboard chasing part of this for a little bit, um, ending the, ending the, the brief evolutive analysis. So there's been some work. Uh, so this has sort of been the summer of BERT uh, for at least the, the circle of NLP researchers that I hear the most from. There's been a lot of work trying to understand BERT and trying to build a better method, trying to sort of figure out how much farther we can push this, um, this idea of pre-training on unlabeled text. And there's been a lot of work, and a lot of it has shown up, in, uh, shown up on Glue. So there are a couple of concurrent papers, MTDN and Alice, that introduced the idea of uh, multitask fine-tuning, sort of combining knowledge across the blue tasks and ensembling. Um, Roberta more recently simplifies the objective a bit from BERT and adds more training data, adds more training data. And Albert, which just came out uh, yesterday, modifies the objective in a different way and um, shares um, shares parameters across layers. So BERT was a 12-layer transformer. Uh, Albert is a transformer with one layer worth of parameters that are just repeated 12 times. This turns out to speed up training quite a bit and allow them to sort of better optimize. And uh, uh, all, uh, all three of Alice, Roberta, and Albert are, um, are characters that appear somewhere in Sesame Street. <laughs> <laughs> so we're seeing some further progress. It's slowing down a little bit. MTDNN gets a little bit of it gets about 86, and then sort of things creep up as you add Roberta and Albert. The state of the art is a little bit over 89 points on this uh, benchmark. This leaves us with a question we really should have answered to start, but we we hadn't gotten around to, and it suddenly became urgent. Yes. So the, the Albert is like a fraction of the parameters that you have in Roberta. Um, I believe the state of the art Albert model is a little bit larger than Roberta. Um, they just they showed that they could do 
nearly as well as Bert at the same size and then made it bigger. Mm. <laughs> uh, so, Katie and Anne and Roberta are the same number of parameters as Bert, though they're not really comparable in other ways. Albert is, is different in quite a few ways. But anyway, we, we really wanted to ask how much headroom is left. Um, we, I mean, we, we can't get a perfect estimate of this. We want to make a serious attempt at finding out what human performance looks like on this task. Is there, can we, can we show that there's, there's any headroom left or are we getting close to Bayes' error on these tasks and we should give up and sort of accept that we've solved these data sets and if we want to make further progress, we'll have to find harder data sets. We did a little human evaluation. Uh, for each of, the, each of the nine tasks, we trained crowd workers by giving them instructions to the task and 20 development set examples they could sort of work through and, and reveal the examples, reveal the labels one by one. We got five-way annotations for each of 500 test examples for each task, and these let us sort of get a majority vote and get a sort of human consensus score for each of these test sets. And we got an overall score of 87. Um, <laughs> So how much headroom do we have left on glue? By our estimate, we have this much headroom. <laughs> so, um, it's, it's, it's obviously the case that our human estimate is conservative, that, that pr presumably humans with more time and better incentives and um, more exposure to the test data could do better. Our machines are doing better. But we don't have that much evidence that there is substantial remaining headroom on these glue tasks. So we wanted to go back and try to put something together harder. So this is thing I'm not going to talk about much in this talk. I'm giving the sort of Pollyanna version, but there's lots and lots of evidence that we have not solved language understanding. For those who might be getting this impression, uh, if you actually take a BERT-based model for something and start interacting with it, it'll often be impressively good, but it's very, very easy to find cases where these models fail bizarrely and catastrophically in all kinds of ways. So there's a lot more room to make further progress on this kind of work, and glue is not a good way of measuring it at this point. We put together a follow-up benchmark. <laughs> it's a revised version of Glue with uh, a new set of tasks, eight new tasks. Um, and we selected these tasks in a more deliberate way. For Glue, we sort of asked around. We, we tried to pick a, an assortment of tasks where we could get, we were allowed to distribute the data, we could get private evaluation data, and that felt sort of diverse enough to cover what we were interested in. For SuperGlue, we were a bit more systematic. We put out an open call, um, advertised this fairly widely, said, hey, we're looking for hard data sets. If you're working on anything involving NLP language understanding and you've encountered a task that you'd, you'd, be, you'd allow us to distribute that represents a hard open problem, let us know and we'll include it. And we did an evaluation for each of these submitted tasks. We, um, we did a human evaluation of the kind I just described and we trained a, a simple BERT model, relatively little tuning, just ran BERT on it. And depending on what you count, we got uh, between 30 and 40 submissions, we wound up with eight target tasks. That's because of these tasks that experts in the NLP community submitted to us as examples of something hard, most of them were actually, were actually solved at or above human level by BERT models. So it was not, it was not trivial to find things that were, that were genuinely open problems using the standard metrics, the standard style evaluation that we're, that we're used to using. But we picked these eight sort of remainder hanger on tasks that are still not solved by BERT. Um, to do that, we even had to expand the set of APIs we're considering a bit. So it's no longer just task text classification. We include multiple choice question answering, the sort of word and context classification task, and a few other task variants that stretch the, the space options a little bit. Have a new set of eight tasks. A um, couple of trends. The data sets tend to be smaller. Um, doing this kind of learning is harder on small test set, small training sets. Uh, this is the, um, the range of data set sizes Glue. This is what it looks like for superglue. We have only one task that's really sort of on the map with 100,000 examples, and, and three of them are under 1,000 training examples. That's what. Is that, is that intentional? That wasn't intentional, but it's something we sort of expected to find. That um, that these these methods, getting the optimization right, getting the fine tuning right with very small target task training sets, is quite a bit. <laughs> Um, and just to highlight a couple of examples of tasks from here, uh, we have a task that's somewhat similar to multi-NLI, um, or, or MNLI. It's a textual entailment task, but it's a textual entailment task that, that highlights a very interesting and difficult special case of entailment. This is um, this case of, they're, put it in their words, does a speaker utterance, something that someone said, 
entail some embedded clause within that utterance. So if someone says a sentence that contains a string of words as a clear constituent of that sentence, is that something that they, they intended or they, they meant or they would stand by? And so this is targeting things like questions or hedging or attributing beliefs to others or sarcasm that would allow you to utter a proposition without committing yourself to it being true. So here you have an example that contains a line like, what do you think? Do you think we're setting a trend? Hypothesis, they're setting a trend. Here, this was labeled unknown. This person neither, in, neither entailed nor contradicted this. They're raising this question. This is one of the easier examples, but you get some fairly weird stuff. Another example I want to highlight is, is multi-RC. This is a um, multiple choice question answering data set, one of many out there, somewhat similar to squad or race, but it's got a somewhat distinctive format and about 5,000 training examples. This is another, another one that we found hard. And I also just want to note that we're, with this benchmark, we're expanding to much longer input text. So we've got uh, text up to about 500 words in the data set. Um, looking at what works, we've only gotten one submission so far. Um, so we started off with the, the BERT baseline at about 60, um, 68 or 69, a human estimate at about uh, 90. And Roberta, the first submission, already uh, made quite substantial progress, getting us up to about uh, five points behind the state of the art. And that's sort of where that leaves off. So um, some of this talk was kind of an advertisement for glue and superglue as a, a reasonable way, a very sort of application-oriented way of measuring progress on uh, language understanding. Um, whenever you give an advertisement in a scientific talk, it's always worth sort of reading the fine print out loud. Uh, so why should, you not, why should you not believe these and not care about them? So here are a couple of prominent reasons. Glue and superglue are built only on English data. Um, English is weird for a couple of reasons. It's this, uh, it's this sort of linguistically odd, big international language. It's also extremely high resource. We have tremendous amounts of unlabeled data and labeled data for many, many, many different, different tasks. Doing this kind of work on a, on, a, on a language with limited labeled data, and especially a language with limited data to begin with, will be quite different. More importantly, this is again only a couple of several reasons, but the thing to be most concerned about is that glue and superglue use natural occurring and crowdsourced data. The multi RC question answering task uses passages from news. Uh, the MNLI task I mentioned earlier uses sentences that were written by tribe workers on Mechanical Turk. Um, one of the things we know about like text from most naturally occurring sources is that it's going to contain evidence of social bias. Like if you see a reference to a nurse in one of these corporate, one of these data sets, the nurse is almost, is very, very likely to be female. And, um, and models, and we should, we should expect these models to learn these kinds of associations, um, even though these are associations that we probably shouldn't or even legally can't use in any kind of ultimate application of these NLP models. And in particular, because this is a benchmark, this is an evaluation tool, Models that learn and use these biases, models learn, that learn to be racist and sexist in the ways that sort of English on the internet reflects racism and sexism, are going to do better on the benchmarks. And we don't have a, we don't have a good solution to this. I think this is, this is not something that you can sort of treat as an isolated machine learning problem and deal with. This is something that will take a lot of work from a lot of different angles to really work around. Um, but I will just say we have some evidence to make this a little bit more concrete. With superglue, we added an auxiliary task um, that doesn't sort of doesn't contribute to the single number, but that lets us measure a bit more about how these models are handling phenomena like this. Um, the auxiliary task just handles uh, gender information. This is drawn from the winner gender schemas from Ringer et al. And what we found here is that Roberta, our sort of one outside submission, does quite well at a co-reference resolution task, but it's nine times more likely than uh, humans to be thrown off by irrelevant gender information. So you can take an example that involves co-reference, it involves a reference to a female nurse, you flip it to a male nurse, human annotators usually won't be thrown off by this, Roberta very, very often will be. So, reason to be concerned. Anyway, before I wrap up, uh, yep. Oh, I just, it was a more about the previous slide, but um, yeah. in terms of what you said, the like human, uh, human performance is like state of the art, but is like is it really like the cap of how well we could do, like or or could we do better? 
Yeah, no, this is a really good question. So, so is, is human performance the upper bound? Is, is that the limit on how well you we can do? So we, we know from Glue that our method for estimating human performance is not a strict upper bound, because we're already doing better. Um, yeah, so it's, um, it's possible our human estimator is just not very good. With, with, crowd working, you with crowd workers, you have issues of people sort of not being super engaged with the task or maybe even trying to cheat. I think those concerns are overstated, but they're still real. Um, more significantly, our annotators aren't experts in the task. They aren't spending a lot of time really learning all the quirks and corner cases of precisely how this task is defined, precisely what counts as valid evidence to answer a question, precisely when you can label something a contradiction. I think that matters a lot. And that's something where models have an easier time, so they are able to look at these large training sets. Um, and, but there is probably, but, but there is sort of, some, there's going to be some upper bound less than 100. We know that all of these data sets contain some errors, um, and it's not going to be possible to solve these perfectly. I don't think we have a good way of estimating precisely where that line is. Yep. Hi. Uh, thanks for this uh, brilliant idea. I'm just wondering, yeah, in the glue, uh, the glue leaderboard, there are some, uh, is the work from uh, Microsoft that they combine the adversarial data with the Robata and could achieve higher results on glue. And how do you think about this? Why it could help achieve better results? Since I think adversarial results might be another kind of data. So how do you, I'm just wondering. I'm just wondering how do you think about that? So I, I don't know. Um, could be worth talking more offline. Um, so this is this sort of adversarial Roberta model. Um, it popped up on the leaderboard very recently. I think the paper might have just gone online in the last couple of days. So I've not, I don't know the full details of how this is put together. And adversarial methods in NLP is a very, very wide family of things. So I'm not sure what that was doing. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. So I've got one last very short section before we close. Um, this is very much oriented toward what if you, you don't really care about any of this stuff, but you have to use it for something. Um, one thing that's worth knowing. So it's a method we're calling stilts, and we're targeting this case where you want to solve a hard task with limited training data, but you have access to lots and lots of data for different tasks that uses sort of similar skills. So for example, commitment bank is this sort of textual entailment style task. It's got 250 examples. It's targeting a very hard corner case. Multi-NLI, or MNLI, is orders of magnitude larger um, and targets a sort of easier and slightly differently defined version of entailment, but still involves a lot of the same kind of, of reasoning. In this case, what we've, what we've recommended and what, what we found to work really well is download the large pre-trained model, download something like Roberta Roberta, uh, fine-tune that model on this intermediate labeled data task, um, this is something like MNLI, your, your data-rich label task. And then just fine-tune the model again on the target task. There's no really principled reason why this should be the best thing to do, but we found this pretty reliably to be, um, to be sort of the most effective way that we've been able to use this auxiliary data. And um, it works as, sort of as well as anything else you might reasonably try, and it works quite reliably. So on glue and superglue, by using uh, MNLI, or possibly also the Quora data as intermediate tasks, you get a um, 1.5 or 2.5 point improvement over a BERT baseline. Um, another paper reported that using the same method with MNLI on the BlueQ question data set gets almost a four point improvement on that uh, question answering task. Uh, another paper reports that with the social IQA, sort of common sense reasoning data set, using that as an intermediate task for a number of other common sense reasoning tasks, gets um, gets quite significant improvements. Um, and this is sort of frustratingly has gotten to the point that both the Roberta and Albert papers, uh, two of the top methods out there, uh, build this in. And we have no baselines without them, so we don't know what the improvement was, but the, the only reported numbers with these models um, use MNLI as an intermediate task in this way for several of the target tasks. And the, the thing I want to emphasize here is the procedure I listed in the last slide is, is all you have to do to get this to work in most cases. That, that these, um, these pre-trained methods generally come with some recommendations about sort of narrow ranges or default hyperparameters that tend to be fairly robust. And what we found is that even if you do need to get some tuning to make the target task work, Often, by doing this multi-step process, you can give up on that tuning. And I, I believe at least 
both of our results here are simply using out of the box, out of the box settings for, for both steps. So if you need to get something to work quickly, I'd recommend doing this two-step procedure. Out of the box works fairly well. We've got a write-up with a bit more on why we think this is, but it's still somewhat of just an empirical mystery that's turned out to be handy. Uh, we did a, a follow-up paper that looked a little bit at just what task combinations seem to work. Uh, try to understand this a bit more in terms of what particular skills we're learning and how transferable they are. I don't think we have a great handle on this problem yet. Um, what we found is that most intermediate tasks harm performance on tasks like blue benchmark, um, especially with BERT compared to older models. Um, this includes a bunch of tasks that were explicitly designed for use in pre-training, but really feels like there are just a handful of tasks that happen to have this property that work really well. Uh, we found this MNLI data set or multitask learning on several different blue tasks um, are the only ones we found really reliably work for, uh, for these individual blue tasks. Um, but ask me, ask me in six months, we're trying to figure, figure out better why this works. Anyway, uh, pretty much out of time. So leave, sort of leave a few practical conclusions and a few open questions, practical conclusions. If you're building a language understanding model now, you've got at least a few thousand training examples for your task and you need the best performance you can get. It's the, the best of these models that's publicly available right now. Um, if you're aware of a big data set for a task that's at all related to yours, or you're working in a very low data regime and you just need something that could possibly help, try the Stilch method. Looking back to the analysis work, don't be too tr quick to trust any one analysis study that claims to tell you what NLP models like BERT know. And uh, shameless self-promotion, keep an eye on super.bluebenchmark.com to sort of see what's new on this kind of work. And if you want some software that implements all of this out of the box, uh, we have a, a toolkit under development, but sort of ready to go called uh, Giant. If you're actually working on this, here are the, the big open questions that, that we think really haven't been solved. This, I think this is a little bit disingenuous, but there's a little grousing in NLP conferences that, oh no, we've solved language understanding, what do we do now? Um, this is obviously <laughs> not true, but if you're interested in working on, on this, this kind of work, these kinds of methods, these kinds of problems, on one hand, they're just basic questions about scaling. How far can we push this stuff? How, how far can we go by just ingesting more of the internet and building more effectively that way? Um, what makes a task suitable for use as intermediate tasks? Sort of how, uh, why is labeled data helpful here? What kind of labeled data is helpful in building these general purpose models? Are we nearing the end of the line for evaluation with standard IID style uh, trained test splits with this style of task design and evaluation design? Um, we were really struck by how hard it was to find test classification tasks were hard for our models, given, again, subjectively how, how brittle these uh, models like BERT have proven to be. I think there's a lot of room to do interesting stuff on evaluation. And then probably most importantly, how do we mitigate or control or even sort of clearly visualize the, the, the sort of social problemat problematic social knowledge um, that these models are picking up on, both during pre-training and when learning on the target tasks? Anyway, I'll leave you with that. Thanks so much for coming. Which model should be used for sarcasm detection? What was that? Which model should be used for sarcasm detection? Uh, um, if, we, if there's any available right now? For sarcasm detection, I don't know firsthand. Um, generally, as I was saying, that sounds like the kind of task that's in the same universe of tasks as a lot of the ones I've been talking about. So I guess the model that works well in most the work the model that works best on most of these is Roberta. That probably would be a good place to start. I think there have been some shared task competitions on sarcasm. So if you can find a recent competition and see what the best systems have been there, that would be another good place to look. Question. I yeah. think um, so what's the task? You talked about this universe of tasks, um, but you never actually defined formally what it means to be given an input and expect some sort of linguistic output. So what's a task? <laughs> Um, I don't know that I have a good good definition here. I think this is a, a concept we toss around a lot that's not been super clearly defined. Um, I think I mean the, the object that I the, the closest thing to a precise definition I can give is it's a a a training set, a test set, and a metric, and maybe a loss function. Um, but there's there's sort of this notion of um, 
having multiple data sets that reflect the same underlying task, that, that translation is a task, or arguably maybe multiple choice question answering is a task. I don't know, but we can precisely define that. Was that, is that the kind of thing you're getting at? I think there's a lot to say there, and I'm not sure I'm going the right direction. I think it's an interesting question, and it's not going to be answerable in this setting, but thank fair, you. Fair. Okay. Okay. So a, a very quick question. I, I'm looking at your uh, superglubenchmark.com, and I can't find the leaderboard. If, uh, there should be a leaderboard button on top. If there isn't, there's a dot, dot, dot button uh, in the corner that should expand it out. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> 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 How much is the overlap in number of tasks between you and SuperGlue? And why do you think like SuperGlue has certain tasks that allows us to do much language understanding better? So from hardware data sets. Yeah. So what's the overlap like between Glue and SuperGlue? We kept one task as is the the RTE series data sets as one task from uh, sort of the gone at all um, a textual intelligence style task. We have one other pair of tasks that are very similar. Um, we had a, a Winograd style task, this sort of hard co-reference set in uh, Glue. We have a different version of, of a similar task um, in, in SuperGlue that, that we were using a fairly awkward format in Glue to fit it into classification. We reformatted it for SuperGlue. So it's sort of two of the eight tasks have something in common. Um, I, think, I, think sort of, I think the difference from one to the other is, is the glue tasks tend to have larger training sets that let you learn more of the quirks of the task, let you really kind of um, get to superhuman levels just by, by, by accumulating all of, these, uh, all of this knowledge about precisely how the task is defined. The super glue tasks tend to be smaller. I don't know if there's a good generalization to make beyond that. Okay, let's do one more. Uh, so I have like a, so have you talked to the uh, Excellent uh, when you're doing experiments? And the second thing is when you're using like probability, or do you do like a probability calibration? Um, so when we're, when we're, yeah, we haven't done anything with ExcelNet. This was uh, one of these models that kind of popped up in quick succession um, leading up to Roberta. Um, I haven't seen that much analysis work that's been done on that. Um, for the for the experiments that we're using um, that we're using BERT's probability estimates directly, we weren't doing any kind of calibration, but we were designing sentence pairs such that we were hoping we wouldn't have to. That where we'd be setting a sentence up where it was picking between two words that were very close in frequency in English, like ever and often, and only one of them could appear in a coherent sentence. So we're hoping that the small difference between their kind of base probability would be dwarfed by the difference in this one makes sense. This one doesn't. Okay. Yeah, let's thank Sam again.